The disciples must have leaned forward as Jesus launched into his explanation of the story of Abraham and Isaac. They were all direct descendants of these two men. And no doubt, they remembered how God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son on an altar. When God made that request, Isaac came under God's order to die. And in all reality, he deserved to die, for he was a sinner. Isaac was bound and placed on the altar, helpless. What God was saying is this, just as Isaac was helpless and could not save himself, so all of us are bound by sin and cannot save ourselves from its consequences. Well, remember how Abraham stretched out his arm and took a knife and prepared to plunge it into Isaac. Abraham was trusting in God's goodness to provide a solution to death. And at the last moment, God called from heaven and stopped him. Because of Abraham's trust, God provided a substitute sacrifice to die in Isaac's place. Just as a ram died in Isaac's place, so Jesus died in our place. We should have died and been punished for our sin. But Jesus died and took our punishment on the cross. He is our substitute. If the ram had not died, then Isaac would have perished. If Jesus had not died, then we would have had to pay our own sin debt, which is separation from God forever in the lake of fire. Now, the Bible says that God honored Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Remember that certificate of debt that every human being has as a result of sin? Well, the Bible says that God credited righteousness to Abraham's account because of his faith. And God did that for Abraham because God was looking ahead to what Jesus Christ would do on the cross. The Bible says that, The words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, that is for Abraham alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Okay, now it's important to see something here in this verse. The words, it was credited to him, those words were not just written to Abraham, but it says they were also written to us, to whom God will credit righteousness. He'll credit righteousness to us. Now you see, we need to remember, we need to understand that down through history, every person has had a certificate of debt, a massive sin debt that each one was accountable to pay. And the only way that that debt could be paid was with one's own eternal death. But then Jesus came and his death his death completely paid our sin debt, completely paid man's sin debt, past, present, and future. That is why Jesus cried, it is finished. That's what he said on the cross. He was saying, the debt is paid. But the payment made by Jesus is only effective if one believes. The Bible says, God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Remember that the word believe as used in the Bible has a lot fuller meaning than we sometimes give it. First of all, the terms faith, belief, trust, and confidence all mean essentially the same. Secondly, genuine trust or faith is built on fact. For example, one could say that the Bible factually states Jesus died in our place for our sin. Faith is not built on feeling forgiven. And last of all, true biblical faith or belief does not stop with a mental assent to the facts. It includes a heart trust or a confidence in the facts expressed by a voluntary act of the will. We choose to believe. It's a very personal thing. For example, we'd say it this way, I believe that Jesus died and paid my sin debt. Well, all of this would have been good news to the disciples. It should be good news to us as well. The Bible says, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, 
so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Therese, we're going to stop right there for a moment. John has just covered some very important details that we don't want to miss. Paul, one of the areas that keeps coming up is this concept of a substitute. Just as the ram died in Isaac's place, so Jesus took our place. That's right. And because Jesus paid the death penalty for us, that removes the need for us to eternally pay those awful consequences for sin. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to the next point. Do we believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that he was doing it for us? Mm -hmm. I mean, the question we face is this. Do we trust God? Do we take him at his word? That's the faith issue. Exactly. Now, let's return to the classroom and see how this is reinforced in the next story. The accounts of Abraham and Isaac were stories that the disciples knew well. And uh, although they'd heard them since childhood, now they were seeing the whole picture for the first time. They were seeing how it all fit together. And uh, undoubtedly, as Jesus spoke, one could have heard a pin drop. Every eye would have been glued on him, the promised Savior, now in their midst. Well, Jesus continued, no doubt, with the story of the Passover. Remember how the children of Israel were held as slaves in Egypt? And God delivered them from Pharaoh with great plagues. And the last plague was the death of the firstborn child. The death of the firstborn child. And God said that if the Israelites followed His word, they would be safe from this tragedy. Do you recall how the Israelites were to sacrifice a lamb? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our lamb. Now, it seems hardly a coincidence that from the time of Jesus' birth, He was identified with these harmless creatures. He was born in a stable, a place where little lambs could be sheltered. His first visitors were shepherds, men who cared for lambs and made sure they come to no harm. We're told that Bethlehem, his birth city, was commissioned by the high priests as a place to raise lamb sacrifices for use in the temple. John the Baptist said of Jesus, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So when we find Jesus identified as the Passover lamb, we shouldn't be surprised. The parallels are stunning, and we're only going to mention a few here. Remember how the Passover lamb could have no defect? Well, Jesus was sinless. Remember how the lamb had to be a male? Well, Jesus was a man. The Passover lamb was killed, dying in the place of the firstborn. Well, Jesus died in our place. He is our substitute. Remember how they took the blood of that lamb and they applied it to the doorpost and the lintel of the house and that only by remaining inside the house could they find safety? Well, it's the same way with us. Only by trusting in what Jesus Christ did on the cross do we find safety from eternal death. Remember how when the death angel came, wherever he saw the blood applied, he said he passed over that house. He passed over over that house. Why? Because judgment had already come to rest on the Lamb. Well, it's the same way with us. God provided a way for His judgment to pass over us, and in so doing, it came to rest on Jesus Christ on the cross. We escape judgment on our sin because Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. God had specifically told the Israelites that they must not break any bones when they ate the Passover lamb. This was because the lamb was a picture, a foreshadow of Jesus. Jesus' bones were not broken either. When the Roman soldiers came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. As the disciples sat there, hanging on to every word, listening to Jesus explain the real significance behind the Passover, they couldn't help but think what time of the year it was. Jesus had been crucified on the very day the Passover lamb died. They had no way of knowing that the priests had hoped to kill him after the feast was over. 
but they did know that God's plan had triumphed. Jesus not only died on the right day, but he died at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., the very hour the temple lamb was offered, the hour of the evening sacrifice. He died right on schedule, just as the Bible said he would. Okay, Therese, we're going to jump in here again with a few comments because this is very important. I don't know about you, but I find the parallels between the events of the Passover and Jesus extraordinary. Well, the Bible is very clear that the Passover is a graphic illustration of what Jesus did on the cross. Mm -hmm. It says that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The substitute lamb again. Exactly. Now, in this next segment, John is going to address a question that was asked by a man that probably lived about the same time as Abraham. His name was Job, and he asked this question, but how can a man be righteous before God? Job understood that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. He knew that only perfect people can live with a perfect God. And we are not perfect people. That's right. Jesus paid the consequences for our sin on the cross but we are still far from perfect. Mm -hmm. How can we ever live in His presence? I mean, this was the question that Job asked, wasn't it? How can a man be made perfect before God? And here's the answer. Listen carefully. Remember the Ten Commandments? The Israelites thought that they'd be easy to obey, didn't they? Today, many people believe that you can please God by keeping the Ten Rules or some modified version of them. But we saw from our study that God expects nothing less than perfect obedience. If you break one rule, just one rule, you are guilty of sin. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Trying to keep the Ten Commandments does not restore the broken relationship with God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law, Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law reminds us of our age-old two sides of the coin dilemma. We have something that we don't want, sin and all its consequences. And we need something we don't have. We need a perfection. We need righteousness. And the Ten Commandments, the law, cannot give us a righteousness equal to God's righteousness. It just cannot do that. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to read to you some verses, and I'm going to explain them as we go along here. It starts out this way. It says, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law. This is not a righteousness that comes from keeping the law. It's a righteousness apart from the law. It says, A righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Jesus revealed to mankind that there's a type of righteousness totally unrelated to the law, a level of goodness that comes directly from God Himself. And the Bible says that to obtain this righteousness, all we have to do is believe. It's just that simple. Simple for us, that is. But for God, it involved a whole lot more. You see, God's just character could not overlook sin and just pretend it never happened. Sin had to be punished. There had to be a death. Now, up to this time, man had been offering animal sacrifices as a death payment, but they were only temporary coverings. Why? Because the Bible tells us that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The animal sacrifices just provided a temporary covering. They didn't take away sin. There, were, there needed to be another solution. Well, was there another solution? Well, perhaps, perhaps we could have said that, uh, you know, maybe one man could have died for another man, but then that man would have had to been both sinless and willing to die. And no such person has ever existed. You see, every man and woman down through the centuries has been confronted by their own personal sin debt. There is no way they could pay for someone else's. 
But then you know what? God left heaven and he became a man, a sinless man. In one remarkable act of selfless love, the scriptures tells us this, God presented him, that's Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. God wasn't going around his just nature. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. You know, God's just nature was completely satisfied with the death of Jesus, a death payment for sin. God had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished because he knew that someday Jesus would die for all sin, past, present, and future, paying the death penalty in full. Jesus died so God could, listen to this, Jesus died so God could demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. The word justified isn't something we're used to hearing, but the word was a judicial term used in the courtrooms of Jesus' day. Uh, Meredith, if you come down the front, and then Ian and James, if you come around the front here, I want you to help me explain just what the Bible means when it says justified. Now remember how at the beginning of time, when God created man, man was innocent of all sin. Man was innocent of all sin. Man knew nothing of evil. He only knew and experienced God's goodness. And God was man's best friend. He would come and he would walk with man in the cool of the day. They had a fellowship, a friendship with each other. That was the way God created things to be. But then man turned his back on God and he experimented with forbidden knowledge. He lost his innocence. And when he did that, man became a sinner. Man became a sinner that was totally corrupted with a dead rat of sin. When that happened, God separated himself from man and he took off the mantle of a friend and he put on the cloak of a righteous, a completely perfect judge. As judge, God found man guilty of a crime, breaking God's holy law, sinning against a holy God. Man stood before a frowning God, accused and convicted as a perpetual, incurable lawbreaker. The sentence was death, eternal death. But then God descended from his judgment seat, and he put back on the mantle of a friend. He put on the mantle of the perfect, pure, sinless Jesus. And God left the lofty heights of the judgment seat, and he descended as a God-man Jesus to stand with us in front of the bench. He had only one purpose, to remove this filthy cloak of sin and take it upon himself to pay our sentence of death for us. And he did just that. Bearing our sin, he died in our place. In so doing, he met the death requirement mandated by the law of sin and death. And he also showed us supreme love. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now we no longer have the sentence of death hanging over us. Jesus paid our sin debt. The sin is gone. But you know what? Not only did Jesus take from us our corrupt garment of sin, but when he did so, he gave us his clean cloak of righteousness. Now when God, the just judge, looks at us, he no longer sees us as sinners, but he rather he sees us clothed in the purity of Christ. And on that basis, God declares us righteous in his sight or justified. And that's what the Bible means when it says justified. It means that God has declared us righteous. Okay, thank you, fellas. 
find your seats again. Thank you for your help here. Jesus was the only one who ever kept the Ten Commandments perfectly, without fault. That is why an unblemished lamb was chosen for the sacrifices, as a picture of his perfection. Because Jesus did not sin, he did not need to die. Since he had none of his own sin to die for, he was able to die for someone else's sin. The innocent Jesus died for guilty man. He died for the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still condemned sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. As the almighty judge of heaven looks at us clothed in the righteousness of Christ, he can now justly raise his gavel and with a crash declare us justified, righteous. But remember, this is only true for those who are putting their faith in Jesus, in the fact that he died in their place. The Bible says that a man is justified by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we said before, the Ten Commandments cannot make a person righteous. No, not at all. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law. But the law had a purpose. The Bible tells us that the Ten Commandments are like a school teacher who takes us by the hand and leads us to the cross and points out to us our need for a Savior. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Everyone needs a Savior, and it's only when we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ will we ever experience God's welcoming smile. Paul, this reminds me of the verse we studied earlier where it said, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Mm. This is exactly what John just finished teaching. Abraham had God's righteousness given to him because he had none of his own. That's right. And we saw that the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, that is Abraham alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. It all ties together. Now, here's something else. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus told the disciples that he had to die. And the idea of Jesus having to die makes us uncomfortable. I mean, we know we don't deserve such love. That's for sure. So Jesus' death was only necessary in this sense. If God had exclusively allowed the just side of his nature to rule, then we would have died for our own sin, and that would have been fair. But his love would not allow that. And on the other hand, if only love had ruled his character, he would have ignored sin for eternity, but that was not an option because of his just nature. Sin had to be dealt with. And it was on the cross that we find the complete and perfectly balanced expression of both attributes, boundless love shown and infinite justice satisfied. From God's point of view, love and justice made the cross necessary. Mm. The scripture says, Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 